but the radio, which had been working absolutely perfectly up to that point in time, was completely and totally dead. And all the way home, I was pressing the various buttons, trying to get the thing operating again, and it was completely and totally dead. I was about three miles from my home. I was just coming along a main Chester Road, approaching a large traffic island, when seemingly as audibly as I'm speaking to you right now, a voice spoke into the car. Ask anything in my name and it'll be given unto you. Command this radio to function. I was so taken aback. I thought, gosh, I must have been working too hard. I'm hearing things. And with greater urgency, the voice came back again. Ask anything in my name. It'll be given unto you. Command this radio to function. So I said, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I command this radio, radio to function. And you know what happened? Absolutely nothing. But the voice came back again. Good. You've listened and you've obeyed. Now leave this radio turned on because when you stop the car and start it again, this radio will function properly. Now, I'm a level-headed sort of a person, but that seems completely and utterly strange and ridiculous. Anyhow, I got to my home. Normally, if I was late home at night, my wife would very kindly come out of the house, lift up the garage door so I could very lazily just drive the car straight into the garage. But that night, for whatever reason, she hadn't done so. So I stopped the car, got out of the car, lifted up the garage door, got back in, started the car again. And instantly, just as a voice had spoken, that radio burst into life. I was so amazed, I rushed into the house, told my wife and children. I said, Margaret, do these things happen? She said, well, I don't know, John. You better ring that young man in your office, Chris. Perhaps he'll be able to throw some light on it. So I picked up the telephone, rang him, and then told him the story I've just recounted to you now. And I said, Chris, do these sort of things happen? And he said, John, not only do they happen, I believe they happen for a purpose. And I believe the Holy Spirit was just speaking to you clearly to see if you were actually listening to his voice and more especially obeying the voice i believe you will have to honor a much much greater test of obedience that was on the monday evening the following saturday we had a, a chapter breakfast a couple of days later i rang the chapter president at the time and i told him the story and he said john that's that's an interesting little little story before our main speak uh, comes to speak on saturday morning i'd like you to share that little testimony don't spend any more than two minutes on it a bit later in the week he rang to tell me he said john I'm, i have to tell you he said our main speaker has had to fly back to canada canada at very short notice but i've managed to get a man he's never ever spoken before but he's agreed to come from the city of worcester to come along and speak Anyhow, I went along to the breakfast as usual, and just as I've shared that story about the car radio, when the time came, I shared the story. And at the end, I concluded my remark by saying, and of course, I'm just waiting to find out what this test of obedience is all about. Now, bearing in mind, I've been praying since July, Lord, if you want me to come out of Freemasonry, you have got to do something so dynamic that I know it's of you. Anyhow, this man had never spoken before at a chapter meeting of the four gospel businessmen. He'd written out his entire testimony on page after page of paper. And he started to read from those pieces of paper. But after about 10, 15 minutes, he suddenly laid them down on the desk and he said, I hadn't, and in fact, there was a long pause. He, he just stood there for about a minute. And I, at, at that point in time, my heart started to, to really race. And I wondered what on earth was going on. And so did everyone. People were looking around. He just stopped. And then he suddenly said this. He said, I hadn't intended to share this in any way. But I just want to tell you that I was very involved in Freemasonry. But the Lord Jesus led me out. And he led me out because I was a junior warden and I had to Part of the uh, recitation that I had to make was that there wasn't a finer thing that, that man could place their trust in other than the foundation of Freemasonry. 
And he said, I couldn't say that. Jesus was my sure foundation. And at that point, I resigned my membership. And at that instant, he said, and the Holy Spirit has just spoken to me. I don't know why this is, but there are two Freemasons in this room today. And God's word for you is that you renounce it and come out. I knew that was the test of obedience I was called upon to honor. As I went forward that morning, he prayed with me. And as I renounced my involvement in Freemasonry, it was just like a sack of potatoes fell off my back. You know, God's word says, he who the sun sets free is free indeed. Praise God tonight. I'm free in the Lord Jesus Christ. He sets the captives free. And, you know, as I've had the opportunity, I've seen many people come out of Freemasonry. And so often, you know, when you can share testimony, other people pick up on it. Um, I was asked to speak in Colwyn Bay in North Wales. And at the end of the meeting, um, a, a man came out. He, he said, I'm the secretary of this chapter, but I am a Freemason. He said, but I've been totally convicted tonight. And he renounced his involvement there and then. But the remarkable thing was, I learned later, that prior to his passing to be with the Lord, in the three and a half years that was left of his life, he led 11 other men out of the lodge that he belonged to. God is no man's debtor. But, you know, sometimes when we make a stand for the Lord, he, there's always a test. At that particular time, there was an architect in Birmingham who was giving us a great deal of work. But he was a very, very high ranking mason, so much so that he had county honours and he was a member of Grand Lodge in London, the highest lodge in our nation. had to meet him for a business lunch and um, as soon as I met him I said Gwyn the first thing you've got to know is that Jesus means more to me than Freemasonry and he looked me coldly in the eyes and he said John you're a fool and you know as he said those words I thought oh my goodness the firm's going to lose all of that work but you know God's word says my God will meet all of my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. For the rest of his life, that man never failed to stop giving us work. He continued. I just find that absolutely amazing. But subsequently, I've seen God move in many ways. Just last year, I was invited up to Cumbria to share my testimony at a church where a man whose entire family was steeped in many generations in Freemasonry. And um, he, he just wouldn't renounce it. Largely, I, th I suspect, out of fear of upsetting his family. Uh, his father, grandfather, all the relatives uh, were involved. But on the Sunday evening, after I finished speaking, he walked down the central aisle and said, you know why I'm here for, don't you? And there and then, along with the pastor of that church, he renounced his involvement in Freemasonry. So that's the second thing I want to share with you. And finally, I want to come on to a bad excitement. You know, as a result of being involved and just being able to share my testimony, I've seen so many, many wonderful things. I just want to share one or two of them with you this evening. First of all, um, I was sitting at my office one day and Alan Jones, who you've already heard mention of today, rang me up and said, uh, John, he said, you have an interesting testimony. Um, I'd like you to start to speak at some of the meetings. And I said, oh, really? He said, yes. Could you go to Merthyr Tidville in two days time? And I actually said, no, I, I can't do it. 
Uh, and he said, well, I do understand, but I'd like you to pray about it. Anyhow, I, I put the f f phone down and I felt absolutely terrible because in truth, I was just absolutely terrified of, the, of getting up and publicly speaking. I'd never done so. And by this time, that young man I mentioned who joined the firm had actually got involved with the work of four gospel businessmen. He was the secretary of a chapter in Tamworth. And he walked in shortly after I'd uh, taken the call. And, and he, he was very perceptive. And he said, Johnny, it looks as if the Holy Spirit's getting at you. What's happened? Uh, and I told him and he said, well, look, he said, Alan is going to be our next speaker at Tamworth. I'm going to put a fleece out if... Um, I won't make my telephone call making all the final arrangements to Alan till the end of the day. If Alan hasn't found someone to speak, will you go? And rather reluctantly, I said, oh, OK. And lack of faith, I suppose, on my part, I was, I was saying, Lord, I do pray you, you found someone to speak. But when he rang up, Alan hadn't found anyone. So I, I went and a couple of nights later, I, I found myself traveling to Merthyr Tidville. And as I crossed the heads of the Valley Road into South Wales, a tremendous snowstorm um, started to come down. Uh, and I was thinking, well, perhaps there won't be too many people there. But, you know, when I went into that chapter meeting that night, it's the largest chapter I, meeting I've ever spoken at. And I've spoken at literally hundreds subsequently. There were 198 people there. And I didn't get on to speak until quite late. But when I finished, people started to come for, forward for ministry. Actually, as I started to walk towards people, people were sliding down walls and collapsing on the floor. It was just it was just absolutely incredible. I just couldn't take it all in. But right at the end of the meeting, this man came up with his little daughter and he said, John, do you believe Jesus heals today? And I said, yes, yes, I do. He said, well, you put your hand on her back, please. And so I put my hand on her back and the whole of her back was taken up with large lumps. And he said, well, as you came here um, this evening, you will have placed Prince Charles, the, the prince who was made king on Saturday. She enters hospital later this week to have surgery. They believe she's got fatty cancerous tumors on her back. Uh, and she needs surgery. But we believe, my wife and I, that Jesus can heal today. Will you pray for her? Well, I'd never really prayed for anyone before, but I just said a very simple word, a, a prayer, asking Jesus to touch her and heal her. And she fell to the floor, and I was concerned because she lay on her back. Well, I didn't lay hands on her. She just naturally fell. Anyhow, after a few minutes, she got up, and she went home, and I went home too. But exactly 12 months later, I had to take a couple of Americans back to that same chapter. They were the speakers. And I was met by the girl's mother. And she came up to me and grabbed hold of my hand and placed it on her back. And it was absolutely smooth. There were no signs of any tumors. And she said, you don't know what happened, do you? And I said, I've no idea. She said, well, my husband brought her home. And it was very late when she got to bed and normally we'd have to go into her bedroom and disturb because she had a disturbed sleep but she slept all through the night and when we opened the door and went into her and got her out of bed every single tumor had disappeared we rushed her down to prince charles hospital they said it was a spontaneous remission but the very week you've returned to Merthyr tidville she's been discharged totally and completely healed She's never had any surgery whatsoever. In fact, many years later, I had a telephone call. Um, in fact, twice because she'd become a mother and she'd had a boy, a girl, first of all, a girl and then a boy. And they'd both in, on separate occasions been taken into hospital. And I was contacted to pray for them. What a privilege to see something like that on the very first time that you have an opportunity to minister for the Lord. To him be all the glory. It's very easy to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Life Stories at Lunch, to receive notifications of when we are live. Simply click the bell.
another occasion, Alan Jones also invited me to speak at his chapter in Wigan. And uh, I went up there and uh, there were far more ladies present on that particular evening than, um, in fact, uh, is normal. They, they outnumbered the men. And I remember thinking, Lord, how on earth can you use a testimony on Freemasonry? But what I didn't know at that particular time, there is actually a ladies branch of Freemasonry in this country. It's called Eastern Star. There are very few in number, only a few thousand out of the total population. Anyhow, I shared my story. And as I finished, right from the back of the room, this lady who was immaculately dressed came up and stood in front of Alan and myself. And she said, do you mind if I take the microphone for a moment? And Alan turned to me and he said, this has never happened before, John. Let's just quickly pray and see if we have a witness. Anyhow, we did. And we both felt it was right. The lady should be past the microphone. And this is what she said. She said, ladies and gentlemen, this is the first time I've ever been to a dinner like this. I'm only here this evening as a result of my friend ringing me up at six o'clock and saying, would I like to come to a, a meeting, a Christian meeting? She didn't know who was going to speak or what he was going to speak on. But I want to tell you that I'm a leading member of Ladies Freemasonry. But only this week, my daughter rang me from Johannesburg in South Africa and said, Mother, as a born again believer, you can no longer be involved in this thing. As I've sat here tonight, the Holy Spirit has totally and completely convicted me. I asked Jesus to cleanse me and forgive me. I publicly renounced my involvement in Freemasonry. Alan turned to me and said, John, the Lord wants to fill this lady with the Holy Spirit. Pray for her. I didn't even utter a word out of my mouth. And the next second, this woman went straight down in the spirit on her back, praising the Lord in other tongues. You know, that is a supernatural manifestation of the Holy Spirit. How I long to see that more often. One final thing. In the flyer that went out about me speaking this evening, it mentioned that, in fact, I'm a former president of the Faculty of Building. Uh, shortly before I retired, I was elected by my peers in the construction industry um, to be the national president. It wasn't a terribly onerous role. Most of the time, all I had to do was turn up with my wife at the various branches around the country um, and put in an appearance. But the final function in my presidential year was to go and speak in Glasgow in Scotland. And I was asked to deliver a speech on the state of the construction industry in this country, but more especially how Britain's construction industry was doing in the world. And so I, I went up there with my wife and I was just getting changed in the bedroom and the telephone rang, an internal telephone. And a voice came on and said, uh, Johnny said, I'm the secretary of the Scottish branch. Um, when you're ready, can you come down? Uh, I just need to brief you on one or two things. So I went down and this man came up to me and he immediately put his arms around my shoulder. He said, I'm the secretary of the Scottish branch. He said, when, um, when it was announced that you were to be the president, he said, um, it said that you were a committed Christian. He said, when you finished your uh, sp speech on the state of the construction industry, I want you to tell everybody what you believe and why you believe. And I immediately assumed he was a Christian. I said, praise God, you're a Christian as well. He said, oh, no, he said, as far as I'm concerned, it's a total myth. He said, um, it's all uh, gobbledygook. But I will have some respect for a man who will put his uh, money where his mouth is. Those are his exact words. So he said, I'd like you to uh, share what you believe. I'll have respect for you if you do. Anyhow, I thought, oh, my goodness, this is a secular dinner. There's over 600 people present at this dinner. I went and had a word with the chairman of the Scottish branch, whose surname was Mason, by coincidence, Derek Mason. And uh, he, he was a Christian. And I told him what the secretary had said. He said, Johnny was announced that you were a Christian when you became the president. I have no uh, problems with you speaking that at all. Anyhow, I still wasn't entirely convinced. I, we, we went into the main banqueting suite. I, I'm, my immediate left was a man who 
uh, I found out was the comedian for the evening. Uh, then myself and to my right was the chairman and also uh, to his right was the other principal speaker, uh, a man who was the chief civil and structural engineer for the city of Glasgow. And at that particular time, he was responsible for the um, repair of the main uh, road bridge over the River Clyde, uh, the piers of which were being eroded by the action of the river. And it was a very expensive 30 million pound scheme at that particular time. And, and I, as I sat down, I said, Lord, I, I, I really would like another witness. And the man on my immediately left, the comedian said, uh, John, the first, after we'd introduce one another, he said, John, I'd like to, to mention that I'm a, I'm a Christian. I said, well, so am I. He said, can I tell you an amazing story? And I said, yes, please do. And this is what he told me. He said, you know, my wife and I had five children. All of our children, except our eldest son, had made professions of faith and were walking with the Lord Jesus. But our eldest son was totally rebellious. He didn't want to know, and it grieved my wife. But exactly one month before my dear wife went to be with the Lord, our son phoned up what had happened. He'd been climbing in the Cairngorms and he'd fell 500 foot down a scree slope. But as he fell, he had a vision of the Lord Jesus and cried out, Lord, save me. And he phoned his mom and dad up to say, the family's complete. I want you to know, mom and dad, that I've asked Jesus into my life. And he said, my dear wife, 